The following message is a presentation of Ligonier Ministries, home of the radio program Renewing Your Mind with R.C. Sproul. But in this session, we're going to consider another person to live by from the Old Testament prophets, the prophet Amos. Now we've examined Elijah, who stood at the beginning of the school of prophets in the Old Testament, and we've considered Jeremiah, who was known as the weeping prophet. Now when we examine the prophet Amos, we meet one who is normally associated with being the voice of social justice and righteousness in Israel. There are many in the churches today in our own time who believe that the church should have nothing whatsoever to do with social political, or economic problems. They have relegated the task of religion strictly to the spiritual realm and say endlessly that the church has no business to speak to these other cultural matters. When those statements are made, we immediately suspect that they are made by people who have never read the prophets because the prophets reveal to us not only their own passion and concern for social justice, but they dare to speak in behalf of God, indicating that God himself is greatly concerned with social issues. Now, the prophet Amos is famous for several different things, not the least of which is the fact that he has several unusual visions. And in these visions, an object lesson is communicated, a message is delivered by God to the prophet for the people through these strange visions. And I'd like to introduce you to Amos by turning to the seventh chapter of his book, beginning at the seventh verse of the seventh chapter. We read there, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Now let me just comment for a moment on the significance of this particular vision. God shows Amos this building, and with the worker's tool of measurement there beside it, and he says to his prophet, Amos, what do you see? I see a plumb line. What's the point of the vision? God said, I am no longer going to look the other way towards Israel. I'm no longer going to shut my eyes to what is happening in the land. But I am going to take the plumb line to my people Israel. I'm going to measure them. What he is saying to the people is, that God is going to call Israel into account and measure Israel against God's standards or norms which are found in the law. So that the vision announces an impending judgment upon the land. And so it is this annunciation of the coming judgment that Amos gives to the people. And he pronounces, again, the very negative and pessimistic word, the high places of Isaac will be desolate, the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Now, in verse 10, we get an inkling of the response of the power structures of Israel to this announcement from the prophet Amos. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, and this is Jeroboam the second, Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel, and the land is not able to bear all of his words. For Amos has said that Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. And so Amaziah said to Amos, O thou seer, 
Go flee to the land of Judah and there eat bread and prophesy there. What's the priest saying? Amaziah, who is the chief priest, he is the royal priest, he is in charge of the central sanctuary in Bethel. And he ministers to the king. And he is the highest religious figure in the land. And he listens to these prophecies of Amos, and he calls him to him, and he said, Now look, Amos, go and be a seer somewhere else. He calls him, in the Hebrew, Anabi, N-A-B-I, which is translated in this text by the word seer. Now there's a difference between a canonical prophet in the Old Testament and these local seers or soothsayers or guild prophets as they were. They were sort of professional cultic fortune tellers who would engage in a financial arrangement with their clients and give them private little predictions for their lives. They were not known for the depth of their understanding of the things of God or for their religious integrity. They were the quacks, as it were, of the trade. And so Amaziah insults this prophet with the most biting sarcasm that he can use by calling him a seer. And he says, why don't you get out of here? Understand that Amos was from Judah. This is during the divided kingdom. And Amos is prophesying to Israel. And so the chief priest of Israel said, what are you doing here? Go back to your own hometown. Go there and eat your bread and if you want to prophesy, go prophesy there, but get away from here. Don't prophesy again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Remember last week we considered the message of Jeremiah, which was to come later when he spoke at the temple in Jerusalem. But here at the royal shrine, the king's chapel in Israel, Amos is giving the same kind of oracle of doom. And what does Amos say to the chief priest? Here we get an insight into the prophet's life and to his call. Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a son of a prophet. But I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Now this is something that could be very confusing and mislead us if we read it merely in some English translations. It sounds as if Amos is disavowing his prophetic role when he says, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. But what's he saying? I'm not a Nobby or the son of a Nobby. I don't belong to that professional order of cultic prophets who prophesy for financial gain. Rather, I am a prophet who has been called directly by God. Do you notice that as we study the prophets, we see that the prophets are very jealous to communicate their chief credential. And that chief credential is the fact that they have been directly and immediately called by God Himself. Jeremiah, last week you recall, God spoke to him when he was still a young man and told him he would put his words in his mouth. And now Amos is saying, hey, I, I don't have anything to do with the professionals. All I am is a herdsman, a gatherer of sycamore, fruit, minding my own business. But God called me from that, and He has commissioned me to be His spokesman. And He said to me, Go and prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore you hear the word of the Lord. You say, Don't prophesy against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore saith the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in this city. 
Your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be divided by line, and you will die in a polluted land, and Israel shall go forth into captivity from this land. That's what I say to you, Amaziah. Your own wife will become a harlot. Your family will be carried away into captivity, and the whole land will mourn. So this is a dreadful announcement that the prophet is making against Israel. Now, to catch the flavor of the prophet Amos, and as I mentioned last week, every one of these men who are in the ranks of the prophets have their own distinctive personalities. Jeremiah cried. He was sensitive. He, he was reluctant to carry out the mournful laments and dirges that God asked him to, to preach. And Hosea is like the poet, as we will see later. He speaks of love and mercy and kindness. And, and each one of them, Isaiah, the great statesman prophet who deals in the royal courts and is involved in, in international politics and the like, each one is different. Amos comes across as the most feisty of the prophets. He is the hellfire brimstone damnation prophet, you know, who thunders against the sin and the wickedness of the people. He seems to be the toughest of the lot. You can imagine people who are like this prophet throughout history. But if you want to see a little bit of his style, let's go back to the first chapter and see how Amos is so clever in the way in which he gives his pronouncements. Right at the beginning of chapter 1, we read as follows. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. Thus saith the Lord. Now note that introduction. When the prophet delivered his oracle, he never introduced it by saying, I have a dream, or in my opinion, or I've done some research and here are the conclusions for my dissertation. He introduced his saying boldly by saying, Thus saith the Lord. This is not my word. This is God's word. Now, if we can imagine a crowd of people assembled in a plain, and Amos is in an elevated place, and he's about to announce a prophetic oracle, and the crowd is excited to hear what this message from God is going to be. Now, also keep in mind that this tiny nation, Israel, has been the victim of all kinds of military defeats and conquests at the hands of her neighbors, as I've indicated in past weeks. And now the prophet is coming to speak of God's visitation of wrath against the traditional rivals and perennial enemies that threaten the borders and the boundaries of the nation. And so he begins to speak. For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. Here the kings of Damascus had used the new iron industry that gave them superior weapons of combat to come in with their chariots and with their broadswords and lay the children of Gilead waste. And that was a thing that really was in the craw of the people of Israel. They cried out to God for revenge. They cried that God would stop the wickedness of those from Damascus. And so now the judgment is spoken. For three transgressions and for four, Damascus, you are going to get yours. What do you suppose the reaction of the crowd was? Hey! Preach it, Amos! They were throwing their hats in the air. They loved it. This is what they had been waiting for all these years, to hear that God was finally going to come down and do something. It would be if, if a prophet were to enter our nation today and say, all right, I see what's going on in Afghanistan. For three transgressions and four, I am going to speak 
to the mighty steel and iron of Russia. And the Americans, hey. For three transgressions in four, Iran. For three transgressions in four, Cuba. For three transgressions in four, Red China. And everybody's cheering, because this is exactly what happens, because he goes on to say, I will break the bar of Damascus, cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avon, and so on. And then he says, to the Philistine nations, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Eden. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza which will devour the palaces thereof. And all the people said, Amen. That's good news. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. And he speaks of the judgment that is to come on Tyre. And then in verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, this Transjordan tribe of the Edomites who had plagued Israel for years, they're going to get it. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away their punishment because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead that they might enlarge their border. Chapter 2, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. Do you notice something about these first five oracles of judgment? That God is saying, I am going to judge these bordering nations because of the violence and destruction that they have brought upon the people through rape and robbery, murder, and military aggression. God is going to speak to their violence. And while the people are in a frenzy of enthusiasm, Amos goes on and he says, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. For Judah. Who? At least it's not Israel. At least it's the southern kingdom, not the northern kingdom. You mean Judah is going to get the judgment of God too? What have they done? This is where Jerusalem is. Because they have despised the law of the Lord. They have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err after the which their fathers had walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem. I'm sure a shockwave went through the audience. But still, even as this was unthinkable, that destruction would come to Jerusalem, still they was reaffirming to the northern kingdom of what they believed all along, namely the intrinsic superiority of the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom. They were certainly relieved to know that the oracle of judgment was directed against Judah. But you notice that in this series of oracles, there is not six oracles that would have been inappropriate to a Jewish list, but there were seven for three transgressions, and for four, O Israel. If you were there, you could have sensed the electricity in the crowd and the instant change of mood from those who were cheering the prophet to those who are now stunned and ready to react with fury. Three transgressions and for for Israel what are they because they have sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes for sins of social injustice for oppressing the poor for bribery in the courts. <laughs>
for quenching the righteous in the land. Those that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. Turn aside the way of the meek, and a man and his father will go into the same maiden to profane my holy name. What's that in reference to? What had happened in Israel was that they had begun to imitate some of the crass, cultic, pagan practices of their neighbors, even to the point of practicing temple prostitution. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. Not only is prostitution practiced openly in the temple and in the sanctuary, but to afford a place of reclining for the prostitute, the bed that is used is made of what? Garments of surety. Now that's something that's foreign to our culture. Does anybody know what a garment of surety is? It's collateral. A man is poor. He needs financial assistance. And so he goes and he seeks a loan. Well, what collateral do you have? It was the same thing was true in Israel as it is today. You almost have to prove you don't need the money in order to get it, right? And they said, okay. He said, I don't have any money. Well, how about your land? I don't have any land. All I have is the cloak on my back, my coat or my gown, my robe. As Jesus, all he possessed was his robe. And keep in mind that in Palestine, it could be very, very warm during the day, but then the temperatures during certain seasons would plummet during the night. A man would not need his coat or his cloak during the day, but he used it at night for two things. He used it to cover himself if he were outside walking around, and he also used it as his blanket when he slept at night. Now here was the law of Israel. If a creditor took for a pledge a man's cloak, the law required that the cloak be given back to the man each night so that he wouldn't freeze to death. So if I was destitute and in need of financial support and I came and wanted to have a loan, I would give my coat, the coat off my back, as my collateral. And the bank would hold that. But it was required of the law that every afternoon when the sun went down, I could go to the bank and pick up my coat and use it for the evening cold, cover myself at night, and then the first thing in the morning I returned my surety to the bank to be held for another day. But here, temple prostitution is taking place right there in the sanctuary on beds made up of pledged garments, which meant that the officials and the priests and the judges are taking advantage of the poverty of the poor and stripping them of their last vestige of clothing and of their dignity, violating the law and keeping those garments of surety all night. You notice earlier in the oracle, he said, for three transgressions and for four, for those who sell the poor for a pair of shoes. What that meant was this, that at the gate, as we will see in our next session, where the poor man came to have his case heard, he was sold down the river through the bribe that was given to the judge, a new pair of shoes. For the price of a pair of shoes, the poor man was losing his rights in court. And what was taking place now in Israel was that the judicial system of the nation was now passing laws and rendering juridical decisions not on the basis of the law of God, and on the principles of righteousness upon which the nation was established.
on the basis of privilege. And the law had come to the point that it favored the rich and the powerful and discriminated against the poor. Lady Justice had taken off her blindfold in Israel and became a respecter of persons on the basis of economics. And that enrages God. And he promises categorically to punish the land because the poor have been sold for a pair of shoes. They drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God, yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oak. I brought you from the land of Egypt, led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up your sons for prophets, and your young man for Nazarites, consecrated and sanctified to me. Nazarites who took a vow never to allow strong drink to pass over their lips. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. The very men that I gave you as my ministers, you systematically corrupted. I'm not going to turn my eyes away from that anymore. And so he raises up Amos to give the most poignant and penetrating divine message on the question of social justice that we find anywhere in the scriptures. And we'll consider the content of that message of social justice in our next session. For more information about Ligonier Ministries, call 1-800-435-4343 or contact us on the web at Ligonier.org. That's L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R dot O-R-G. Or write P.O. Box 547500, Orlando, Florida, 32854. The following message is a presentation of Ligonier Ministries, home of the radio program, Renewing Your Mind with R.C. Sproul. Right in our last session, we considered briefly something of the personality of the prophet Amos and the historical circumstances of his call and of his prophecy that was delivered to the people of Israel, which was not very warmly received by the high priest of the royal cult, Amaziah. And I said that we would consider in more detail in this session some of the content of his message of social justice and of righteousness. Let's look, if we can, at chapter 5 of the book of Amos, beginning in verse 18, where we have here an introduction to a very important oracle of doom that comes from the lips of the prophet Amos. He begins by saying, Woe! unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Now that concept, the day of the Lord, was a very, very important concept in the national life of the Jewish people. The day of the Lord was what we would call the last judgment, the end of the age. Christian people today oftentimes sit around and dream and speak in glowing terms about the return of Christ and how we look forward to it and we pray that it will be soon. Well, in the Old Testament, the prophets of the day spoke of that messianic day of the Lord where God would come and bring his righteous reign to bear upon the earth. And those who were suffering and who were enslaved and who were victims of oppression look forward to the day of the Lord because it would be a day of final vindication for those who had been faithful. And so in the liturgy of the Jewish feasts and of their worship, together they would pray and sing psalms of rejoicing as they looked for the day of the Lord that was to come. 
And this, of course, came up out of their experience of their past where they had come from powerlessness, where they had been in bondage, where they had been the slaves of other people. And now they were looking for that future bright and glorious day. And Amos begins this oracle by saying, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? For the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him and went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, and the serpent bit him. Do you get the imagery of this? Here's a man who's in serious trouble. He's walking down the street, minding his own business. Whoom! A lion pounces out of the brush and jumps right in front of him. He turns around and runs as fast as he can. He runs around a corner right into the hands of a grizzly bear. Okay? And that one takes a few swipes at him. And just as he's ready to escape from that, he runs into the house, slams the door, he wipes his brow and says, whew, leans up against the wall, and a serpent bites him in the hand, you know, and puts him away forever. He said, that's the precarious situation that Israel is in right now. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. You're praying for the day of the Lord. Don't do it. It's like I say to my people around here, whatever you pray for, don't ever ask God for justice. You might get it. It's the last thing you want. For yourself, we beg for mercy, not for justice. And he says, I hate your feast days. God says, I despise your solemn assemblies. I am angered by your corporate worship. Though you offer me burnt offerings, your meat offerings, I won't accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I don't want to hear the melody of them anymore. But let justice roll down as an ever-flowing stream. Don't come to church and sing your songs and pray your prayers and offer your burnt sacrifices to me. They're a stench in my nostrils if there's injustice in the land. There's a black preacher in America who read this text. And he started running around the country preaching the same sermon all over the place, saying, I have a dream. I have a dream. that there'll be freedom in the land, that there'll be equal opportunity before the law. And the text for that sermon, I have a dream, was from the book of Amos. Let justice roll down like an ever-flowing stream. God was despising the face of Israel because... Righteousness was not the standard by which judgments were made in the courts, in the land. The criminal justice system in Israel had become corrupt. As I said in the last hour, the laws began to reflect not the principle of righteousness that reflected the holiness of God, but the laws began to reflect the vested interests of the ruling classes. There's a disenchanted Jewish young man who was raised in a very strict religious home in Germany. And his father insisted to this young man that all of the principles of Judaism be maintained without compromise, even if it meant social ostracized. And the young boy was filled with enthusiasm trying to fulfill what he was learning in synagogue and at his father's table. His father was a businessman. And then on one occasion, a recession came to the land and the father's business began to be in trouble. And so he uprooted his family and he moved him to another town in Germany. But that town, the Board of Commerce, 
was controlled not by the Jewish community, but by the Lutheran community. And the next Sunday morning, the Jewish father dressed up the kids and took them to the church in the Lutheran church and insisted that everybody convert to Lutheranism because it was necessary for business. And this kid said, hey, I get it. Religion is simply something that people use for economic control and power. And the guy, the kid went to school and he went over to the British Museum and he was quiet and he was withdrawn. He sat there in a the corner, nobody paid any attention to him. And he sat over there in a the corner studying all he could about the history of religion and the history of economics. And he finally came to this conclusion that the whole history of civilization isn't conditioned by great noble ideas of metaphysics or philosophical principles or ethical principles, that everything is controlled and determined by one thing, the economic forces. He read the grandiose systems of the philosophy of history of, of Hegel, who saw all of history as an unfolding of an absolute ideal. He's, he said, nah. The forces of history are not the forces of dialectical idealism. They are the forces of dialectical materialism. And Karl Marx considered and invented a whole understanding of history and reality on the basis of economics. And he began to be bitterly impassioned against organized religion, particularly Christianity. Because he said, religion comes on the scene this way, that religion is invented by the bourgeois, by the capitalist, by the haves, by the owners, by the rich, and by the powerful. Because the means of production are always controlled in a capitalist society by the few rather than the many. And the wealthy and the owners who control the means of production, they always have to live in mortal fear of a mass uprising and revolution from the proletariat, from the workers. And so the issue is, how do you keep the workers in line? How do you keep them down on the farm? How do you keep them from banding together, having a revolution, and having an equal distribution of the wealth? He says, you invent religion as an opiate to lull them to sleep. And you tell them that there's a God who honors the dignity of their labor. And that God is on their side. And if they keep themselves from violence or from greed or from lust and that sort of thing in this world, that then on the other side of the Jordan, there will be streets of gold and a crown of glory with precious jewels. And in the meantime, the capitalist who invents all this stuff is laughing all the way to the bank. The church is initiated and controlled by the capitalist to keep the proletariat in line. And the law structure is not come from Mount Olympus or from Sinai or from heaven. The laws of the land always reflect the vested interests of the ruling class. In most capitalist societies, said Mark, the worker or the slave does not have the right to suffrage. He has nothing to say about the legislation that's going to come about. And he said that in America, it was inevitable that the law would become a manifestation of power groups. One of the great heroes of American history is Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, who wrote the most important treatise on common law in the history of our nation. And what does he say in the preface of the book? 
following after James and Pierce and Dewey and their club that they had up at Harvard. He said, law must never be designed to reflect some kind of eternal truth or absolute principle of justice or moral imperative as we find in the metaphysical ethics of Immanuel Kant. He says that in the preface. He said, but all law it must always express the prevailing will of the majority of a given location at a given time. You notice that the Supreme Court doesn't make judgments. They make decisions. And we know now that it's the acceptable way of legislation in our nation. When a law is passed, not to test it according to some absolute standard of righteousness or of justice, but whether or not it fits the contemporary standards of the community. If you want legislation to pass, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to get a lobby group. And you get it together, and it becomes a political power machine in Washington. And it lobbies for its vested interests. And if it's able to achieve its legislation that favors their vested interests, and that particular piece of legislation happens to leave you out in left field, what's your alternative? To cry, injustice? It's not just? No. Your only hope is to get enough people together to become a lobby group to try to change that legislation. And on and on and on it goes. Because we say there are no moral absolutes. There is no such thing as eternal law. There's no such thing as natural law, a principle upon which this nation was established. In fact, the Constitution of the United States is incomprehensible apart from the concept of natural law. When was the last time you saw anybody talk about natural law? in terms of American jurisprudence. Today we have what is called law positivism. Particular pieces of legislation that may or may not have some kind of relationship to eternal verities. God said, I'm not going to put up with that because that inevitably produces a legal structure that oppresses, that disenfranchised the poor and the powerless. I want justice, not sacrifices. And if I don't have it, I will cause you to go into captivity. Let's go over to chapter 8, where we have another vision. Thus the Lord God showed unto me, saying, Behold, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. What's the implication here? Do you think that it's a nice, fresh, heaping basket of shiny red apples? Crisp oranges and cantaloupe? No. It's rotten. That's what he sees. A basket of rotten fruit. And he said, the Lord said, the end is come upon my people Israel. The songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day. There shall be dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? Oh, how we hate these feast days. Oh, how we hate the Sabbath. Just when we have our produce going full orb and we got the cash registers jingling, along comes the Sabbath day or a feast day and we have to put a close sign on the merchant shop's door. That's interfering. This religion is beginning to interfere with business. We can't have that. You can see the merchants running around trying to get legislation to get rid of the blue laws of Israel. Why? These festivals that had been established by God to refresh the people, to heal the people, to cleanse the people, to strengthen the people, had to go because 
they interrupted prophets. He's saying what happens here in Israel is that the prophet motive, which in and of itself is legitimate and God himself legitimizes it, but it has become so distorted that it is eclipsing the very foundation of righteousness in the land. It's out of whack. It's run amok. And he says, these people say, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great. You know what that means, short pints, uh, clipping the coin, falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. Again, there's that same line. And sell the refuse of the wheat. That was to be left at the edge of the field for the gathering and the collection of the poor. See? But now that little, tiny little, God just asked it, just a, God didn't ask the people of Israel to give away 50% of their profits to the poor. God didn't impose communism, you know, to them. He said, hey, look, if you work, you can enjoy the fruit of your labor. You know, that's fine. You have a great big field and a great harvest and anoint your head and sing your songs and praise God for the blessing of prosperity. But this is what I require, that at the edge of your field, you leave something there for the poor. Oh, and the dogs eat the crumbs from them. Leave the crumbs alone. Boy, these greedy guys are going around saying, hey, there's a 2% of our, our possible profit being gathered up by these vagabonds. We can increase our profit if we start selling that. And the poor went hungry. The message of Amos is this. That the heartbeat of God is with the helpless and the powerless. And it's interesting to note that Amos never attacks the rich for being rich. He is not attacking wealth. He is attacking wickedness. And in this particular period in Israel's history, there wasn't a whole lot of difference. It just so happened that wealth and wickedness was going pretty much together. Because those who were controlling the market and controlling the courts used that system which God had established in the first place to protect every man's dignity and every man's right as a means to protect their own vested interests. Have you ever heard a businessman say about his lawyer that I hire my lawyer to keep me out of jail? You ever heard that? <laughs> I mean, we say it, you know, in a jocular fashion. I have my lawyer to keep me out of jail. That's what I pay my lawyer for, to keep me out of jail. That can be taken many different ways. But we have to understand as Christians that there is a difference between righteousness and legality. Just because something is legal does not mean that it is righteous. And so when a Christian in business or in any activity wants to know, am I allowed to be involved in this particular procedure or behavioral pattern, he's got to go beyond asking the question, is it legal? Can I find a legal loophole to do it? He's got to ask, is it righteous? Because he must never make the mistake of assuming that there is a one-to-one -one equation between the law of the land and the law of God. The law of God may, in fact, prohibit what the law of the land permits. And conversely, the law of God may permit what the law of the land prohibits. Let it never be said by a knowledgeable Christian that religion has nothing to do with politics or economics or with social issues. There's a great cleavage among Christians today. Those who say, well, social action is something 
that the liberals are concerned with, and evangelism is something that the conservatives are concerned with. And among conservatives, there tends to be at times almost a paranoia about being involved in social issues. That has not been the case throughout 2,000 years of church history. Historically, it's been the Orthodox Christian who's been at the avant-garde of social consciousness. But what happened in the 19th century is important for us to understand because in the 19th century, with the advent of so-called liberal, and that's a technical term here, liberal theology, liberal should be a good word, but liberal theology meant anti-supernatural theology. No miracle, no resurrection, no deity of Christ and tried to reduce Christianity to some kind of ethical core. and said the gospel is really a social message. Brotherhood of man, the fatherhood of God, and let's go work for the kingdom of God on earth in terms of brotherhood and the cessation of war and human virtues and peace and all of that. And so what the liberal of the 19th century did in the church was that he tried to reduce Christianity to social action, period. And so the conservative came around and said, wait a minute. The gospel is more than social action. The gospel has to do not only with reconciliation at an earthly level, but it has to do with man's most fundamental question, reconciliation with God. And dealing with the way in which we have been unfaithful to our God and the ravages of sin. What that means? That means we need the atonement of Christ. We need to be reconciled with God. And that's the message of the gospel. And don't turn that in to a program for the poor and the oppressed. And so the evangelical has been fighting to preserve the core announcement of the gospel, which is the cross of Christ. And the liberals have been running around emphasizing social action. And what has happened over the last few decades is what? The liberals have been identified with social action. The conservatives have been identified with evangelism so that now they've got a whole generation of conservatives thinking that there's something wrong with social action. Guilt by association. That's something the liberals do. See, Something the liberals do. Thank God that the liberals have kept that vision alive because that responsibility is laid at the doorstep of the church. Not that we're to be the government, but we are to be the conscience of the government. To be the conscience of the lawmakers of our land. Reminding them, day and night, that the law is to reflect righteousness. Not the vested interests of some controlling group. That's the message of Amos. And it's a message of doom if a nation is impenitent at that point. He finishes it by prophecy by saying the land itself will mourn. The fiber of the people will disintegrate when its legal structure does not manifest the righteousness of God. That should be a concern for every Christian if we hear the words of the prophet. For more information about Ligonier Ministries, call 1-800-435-4343 or contact us on the web at Ligonier.org. That's L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R dot O-R-G or write P.O. Box 54-7500, Orlando, Florida, 32854. Ligonier Ministries, the home of Renewing Your Mind, presents Dust to Glory, an overview of the Bible with R.C. Sproul. Let justice roll down like an ever-flowing stream. I think that verse taken from the book of the prophet Amos is familiar to anyone who lived through the civil rights struggle in our own national history, as it was a favorite text of the Reverend Martin Luther King. The text of Amos has been a longtime favorite for all of those engaged in social activism because of all of the minor prophets. Amos stands out as God's voice in behalf of the poor, 
and of the oppressed. There are often many misconceptions that come out of the work of Amos, but Amos' chief concern was that righteousness be present in the land. His concern for justice was not simply a matter of criminal justice proceedings, but rather on the behavior of the people and particularly of the government with respect to interpersonal relationships. When we look at Amos, Amos seems to be somewhat of a grim and unhappy type of prophet who spends so much time talking about the justice of God that we barely get a glimpse of God's mercy in his work. That, in his, uh, work. That's why today we're going to look briefly at both Amos and Hosea. They're kind of twin prophets of the 8th century B.C., and the accent of Amos is on justice, and the accent of Hosea is on mercy, but it would be uh, incorrect to assume that all that Amos was concerned about was justice and that all that Hosea was concerned about was mercy. We're just talking here about the difference in emphasis. In the book of Amos, early on, in chapter 1, we read this statement. Chapter 1, verse 3, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. And then what follows is a prophetic announcement of God's judgment upon the city of of Damascus. And then in verse 6, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse 9, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. And what's going on here is a series of oracles being delivered by Amos by which God, speaking through His prophet, announces His judgment on the wicked nations and cities that surround Israel. Now, I like to imagine this scenario, that Amos is surrounded by his, by his people from Israel. He himself is from the southern kingdom of Judah, but he is prophesying now in the north And I see him gathering all of these people around him, and he's speaking about God's going to judge Damascus. And when he says, for three transgressions and for four, I will not withhold my punishment on Damascus, the people are roaring and they're cheering. That's great news. And then he says, for three transgressions and four, I'm going to judge Gaza, and the people cheer again. And I'm going to judge Edom, and I'm going to judge this nation and that nation. And we can see a rising crescendo of excitement among the people as the judgment of God is being announced on their pagan neighbors. But then, at the height of their excitement, Amos says, and for three transgressions and four O Israel, I will not withhold my punishment from you. And it's as if he sets a trap for his audience as all of a sudden their joy turns to bitter sorrow and hostility against the voice of this prophet. One of the most important themes that we find in Amos has to do with an idea that is deeply rooted in Old Testament religious faith. It predates the prophets, and it was the expectation of what was called the day of the Lord. It's sometimes called the day of Yahweh, and other times the day of God's visitation. And in antiquity, the Jewish people longed for that future when God himself would visit his people and manifest himself clearly. And and the people look forward to this with exceeding great joy. It was their eschatological hope. 
to be sure. In fact, when we come to the New Testament and we remember the annunciation by the angel Gabriel, not in this case to Mary, but to Zacharias of the impending birth of John the Baptist, that when under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Zacharias sings the Benedictus, he mentions in his song of praise his great joy for God was visiting his people and that they look forward to this day of visitation. But as I said, in the tradition, the day of the Lord that was anticipated was a time of the visiting of God's mercy and grace and of salvation. But let's take a look briefly at what Amos does with this favorite hope of the people. In chapter 5, verse 16, Amos says this, Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the Lord says this, There shall be wailing in the streets, and they shall all say in the highways, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmer to mourning, the skillful lamenters to wailing, and in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through you says the Lord, not I will pass over you as he did in Egypt, but I will pass through you. And then he gives this oracle of doom. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Other translations read as follows. It is a day of darkness. There is no light in it. This is the most pessimistic presentation of the concept of the day of the Lord that we find anywhere in the Old Testament. For Amos, he said, Woe to you who are eagerly awaiting and desiring the day of the Lord's visitation, because what you are looking forward to in joyful anticipation is going to be a tremendous surprise to you. You will be like people who are fleeing from a lion, and just as you think that you've escaped the lion, you run headfirst into a bear. And you run from the bear, and you rush back to the safety and sanctuary of your house. You run inside the house, close the door, breathe a sigh of relief, lean your hand against the wall, and a poisonous snake bites you. That's the imagery that he uses to these people. And he's speaking now about the coming judgment upon Jerusalem. Now we will see in a few moments that Hosea tempers the idea of the judgment that is now associated with the day of the Lord and holds out a future hope for the remnant of Israel for whom the day of the Lord will be a blessing. And if we would Follow this theme throughout the prophets, Isaiah, Zephaniah, for example, Joel, and into the New Testament, we will see that the day of the Lord becomes a concept that's very important to biblical theology that is a double-edged sword. For those who are not prepared for the coming of the Lord, it is a day of darkness with no light in it. But for those who are eagerly awaiting his coming and his appearance, for them it is a time of unparalleled blessing and of grace. In the New Testament, the incarnation of Jesus is described variously by the term visitation. But even there, his visit to this world is a time of exceeding great joy for those who are faithful to the covenant and who welcome his coming. But his coming is also a crisis because it brings judgment upon those who reject him. He comes to his own, and his own receive him not. 
and even in the latter days of his ministry, he laments on Palm Sunday over the city of Jerusalem. And he tells them that destruction will come upon the city because they were not ready in their day of visitation. Now, Amos, as I say, being from the south, incurs the wrath of those who live in the northern kingdom, the priests of Bethel, Amaziah, accused Amos of being in a conspiracy against Israel. And he says in chapter 7, verse 10, the land is not able to bear all his words. And in verse 12, Amaziah says to Amos, go you seer or you prophet, flee to the land of Judah, eat your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and is the royal residence. And Amos answers Amaziah with some strange words, but I think they're important to understand this book. Amos answered and said, I am not a prophet, nor a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, what's going on here is that Amos denies that he's a prophet, and yet here he is celebrated as one of the most important canonical prophets of the Old Testament. Why would he announce publicly to the priest of Bethel that he's not a prophet? I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet. Well, the word that he uses here in the Hebrew is the word nabi. And a nabi was made reference to, that's why this translation that I read from today uh, translates it seer. In Israel, there were, in addition to the canonical prophets, those who were charismatically endowed by God to be agents of divine revelation, to be his spokesman to the nation. There were also professional prophets, institutional prophets, cultic prophets who were prophets for hire. And when Amaziah rejects Amos, he is calling him a run-of-the-mill, cultic, professional seer. So go practice your trade somewhere else. And Amos is saying, I'm not that kind of a prophet. I'm not a prophet with a little p. I'm a prophet with a capital P. I am speaking the word of the Lord. And so I hope that explains this uh, enigmatic portion. Then we read that, uh, that God is going to bring the judgment upon the people, and he says earlier in chapter 7, God showed Amos a plumb line. And the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not pass by them anymore. This plumb line is one of several visions. There's the vision of fire, there's the vision of of the basket of summer fruit, and so on, which illustrates a common thing that we find in the prophets. The prophets are noted for giving object lessons, strange behavioral patterns, that they exhibit the truth of God, through running through the streets naked or Ezekiel lying on his side for many months, and in this case, having visions that have symbolic meaning to the people that communicate the Word of God. And all of these visions that we find here in chapter 7 and 8 have to do with uh, uh, the visions of the coming judgment of God upon the people. Now, In the book of Amos, I'll finish with this. As I said, the central motif is about social righteousness because what God is concerned about in Israel is immorality, social injustice, and religious apostasy. 
So that God says to the people, I despise your feasts, I abhor your solemn assemblies, your sacrifices have become a stench in my nostrils, because though you have the outward trappings of religion, you are treating each other in an oppressive way. For the poor are sold for a pair of shoes. And then he turns his attention to the wealthy class of people who, for the most part, were in the controlling government of the time and says that the women have become like the fatted cows of Bashan. Now, imagine a prophet saying that today in a congregation, standing up to the wealthy ladies in the, in the church and say, you fatted cows of Bashan, you recline on, on uh, beds of ivory, and yet... You sell the poor for a pair of shoes, and there is no justice in the gates. And when he talks about justice in the gates, he's talking about the court system that is supposed to be impartial and give no partiality either to the poor or to the rich. And what is happening now is that the judges are accepting bribes, and they are distorting the principles of the law of God that were a part of his covenant. Now, as I said, the prophet Amos emphasizes this concern of social righteousness. Hosea, his counterpart in these days, is perhaps most famous to us because of the situation that takes place at the beginning of the book that bears his name, where Hosea is chosen by God and commanded to go out and marry a harlot, presumably a professional prostitute. And let's look at this uh, narrative that we find at the beginning of the book of Hosea, where in the first chapter, verse 2, we read, The Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Now, this is important. As I said, the prophets constantly used object lessons. And here was the supreme object lesson that God was trying to demonstrate to his people by telling Hosea to marry a prostitute. The reason for it is obvious. Because my people have become a harlot. My bride has been unfaithful to me, and yet I have stayed married to this bride for so long, and I have tolerated and have been patient with her infidelities. But now the time of judgment is at hand. And so we read on in in the first chapter. So Hosea went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And God said, call his name Jezreel. For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu, and I will bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Again, predicting the military defeat of Israel that will take place in the valley of Jezreel. And so the firstborn son of Hosea is given a name that communicates and embodies the prophecy of God. Then he goes on to say that his wife conceived again and bore a daughter. And God said to him, call her name Lo-Ruhamah. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel. The name means no more mercy. What's your name, little girl? My name is no more mercy. God gave me that name because he has said to his people and to his unfaithful bride, I will forbear no longer and give no more mercy. But the deepest poignancy of this protracted object lesson, I believe, is with the birth of the third child. Now, when she had weaned, lo, Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. 
And God said, call his name Lo-Ami, which being translated means not my people. And God is saying to Israel, you who I called to be my covenant people, you whom I married in the wilderness, and I said that you would be a light to the Gentiles, I would be your God, and you would be my people, and I set you apart and consecrated you to be a holy nation. No more. Now you are to me lo ami, not my people. It's fascinating that in the New Testament when the apostles speak of the ingrafting of Gentiles such as ourselves into the church and into the kingdom of God, it is said of us that God took a people who were no people and made us his people. But that does not mean that God's rejection of his covenant people at this point in history was full or final. As I said, Hosea is the prophet of hope and of mercy. So far, there's been precious little hope and precious little mercy in this text. He, in chapter 2, uh, God commands Hosea to divorce Gomer. Again, to symbolize God's divorce decree against Israel. But then, in chapter 2, verses 14, we read as follows, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, I will bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor is a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer my master. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And then in verse 23, And I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy, and I will say to those who were not my people, Ami my people. Once again, God will restore his bride to himself and call his people by his name. For more information about Ligonier Ministries, call 1-800-435-4343 or contact us on the web at Ligonier.org. That's L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R dot O-R-G. Or write P.O. Box 54 7500, Orlando, Florida 32854. The following message is a presentation of Ligonier Ministries, home of the radio program Renewing Your Mind with R.C. Sproul. We are a people who have been reared not only on television, but still with the lingering influence of the folklore of Western civilization that includes a significant portion of fairy tales. Fairy tales are part of our children's heritage. And most of the fairy tales that we read or see in animated movies are upbeat and they deliver a message of hope. They indicate the victory of good over evil. But always there seems to be the beautiful princess who's impoverished or suffering in some way, like Cinderella, confined to the soot and the ashes of the hearth, who serendipitously has the opportunity through the good intervention of the fairy godmother to go to the ball and to meet the prince and live happily ever after with him. I think now of a song in the film version of Snow White and the Seven Drawers. 
where Snow White is wistful and yearning and dreaming in her fanciful imagination of her future happiness. And what does she sing? Some day my prince will come. She looked to the future for a day that would be her day of redemption, that would be her day of gladness, would be the day when all of her problems would be over. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked forward to a particular date in human history, apart from the return of Christ, but just in your own chronology, looking forward, well, when that happens, then all of my aspirations will be fulfilled. My wife, whom I've been married for 35 years, we began to go together in the eighth grade. That was the third time. We'd gone together twice before that and broke up, but we got serious when we were in the eighth grade, and we went steady, as it were, for eight years. Six of those eight years, we were separated by attending different schools. And when we were apart, I used to write her a letter every single day, and she wrote me a letter every single day. And at the bottom of every letter I wrote to her, I wrote a P.S. I am waiting for you and our Day. In fact, I said it so often, I finally had stationery made up where I had it printed at the bottom to save me the effort because I just ended every letter with that saying, P.S., I am waiting for you and our day. And both of us used to keep the days on our tablets at school, you know, 947 more days because we set the date of our marriage years before we actually were married. And we would cross them off a day at a time. And I remember when we finally got under 100 days and then down to single digits. It was fantastic because all of our hopes, all of our aspirations were poured into that date, to that day in the future. And now that day is past and it's the occasion for annual celebration and remembrance. Well, this is common to human beings. And there is a concept in the Old Testament that's very important to the theology and to the religion and the life of the people of Israel. And that concept is called the Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord. And if you trace it through the Old Testament, you will see that early on in the life of the Jewish people, the future promise of the Day of the Lord is a time of anticipated joy and pleasure and redemption. It would be the day of God's visitation, the time when God would come and vindicate His people from all of the persecution and suffering that they had received from wicked people and from wicked nations. It would be a time of unspeakable joy and celebration when the majesty of God would become apparent God himself would appear in blazing glory and light and all of the nation would rejoice but as the history of Israel unfolds and the people grow more and more wicked and they compromise the covenant more and more and move further and further away from the law of God, a storm cloud begins to develop and arise on the horizon, begins to cast a shadow over this future promise of the day of the Lord. And by the time we get to the 8th century prophets, where God's wrath now is going to be poured out in judgment, first against the northern kingdom of Israel in 722, and then later on in the next century to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. The prophecies of the future become darker and darker. And we find one such prophecy, which is a hard saying, in the words of the prophet Amos. If we look at chapter 5 of the book of Amos, beginning at verse 16, we read these words. Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, says this, There shall be wailing 
in all streets. And they shall say in all the highways, Alas! Alas! They shall call the farmer to mourning, and skillful lamenters to wailing. In all vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through you, says the Lord. Boy, is that scary. This is not the promise of the Passover. But now God is announcing that the angel of vengeance, his angel of wrath, is going to come now not to Egypt, but to Israel. Not to pass over the land, but to pass through it. When that happens, there will be weeping and wailing in the streets and the people crying out, Alas! Alas! Now here the next words of the prophet. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Oh, what a dreadful statement. Think back for a moment to Snow White standing at her windowsill, singing into the night, a dream is a wish your heart makes. Dreaming of the prince that will come, putting all of her hopes in this future meeting of her hero. And imagine that she discovers that the prince who comes is the prince of darkness, the prince of evil, the wicked prince who takes her away. This is the kind of message that God is saying to his people. You who long for the day of the Lord, you who are so caught up in the rapture of eschatological anticipation and hope, you can't wait today for the return of Jesus. You can't wait for the coming consummation of his kingdom. You read every forecast of his return. You watch every television program that announces the coming of Christ. You circle every passage in the New Testament that promises his glorious return on clouds of glory where he will bring a new heaven and a new earth and causes you to rejoice in anticipation. The day of the Lord. But Amos is speaking to a generation who desire the day of the Lord but who have become so estranged from God that the day of the Lord was not a good day for them. As Christians, we look forward to the return of Jesus with great anticipation, the day when our Prince will come and will set aright all of those things which are unjust and out of kilter in this world. We long for that day as a time of vindication a time of healing for the nations, a time of the final realization of the fullness of our salvation. But what if our faith is a hypocritical faith? What if it's not real? What will happen to us on that day? You see, when the New Testament speaks of the return of Christ, it speaks of it in two different dimensions. On the one hand, it is the day of final salvation for the people of God. On the other hand, it will be the day of final judgment where God's long-suffering and patience with wickedness will come to an end. And so it will be a two-edged sword, won't it? For those who are saved, it will be the time of exquisite delight. For those who are not, 
it will be the ultimate time of judgment and doom. What will it be for you? Will the time of Christ's appearing be a time when you will be enraptured with joy and blessedness to see the coming and manifestation of your Lord and of your Savior? Or will this be a moment of unspeakable horror when the judge appears and calls you into account? The day of the return of Christ will be a day of gala celebration for some and for calamity for others who will be crying and wailing in the streets, crying for the hills to cover them and for the mountains to fall upon them and the last muffled murmurs of their cries will be, Alas! Alas! This is the warning that Amos gives. You're looking for the day of the Lord, expecting a day of light. But I say to you, to those who are impenitent, that the day of the Lord will be a day of darkness. And then he repeats that. He says, the day of the Lord will be a darkness that is a very great darkness with no light in it. The greatest pleasure we can ever hope to enjoy is to experience the radiance of the countenance of Christ, the beholding of the manifestation of His unveiled glory. And the Scriptures uniformly describe the majestic radiance of Christ in terms of the metaphor of light. We go to the book of Revelation and we read of the new heaven and the new earth that comes down out of heaven and we note something extraordinary there that in the new heaven there is no sun. There are no artificial means of illumination because they're totally unnecessary. Because the light that is generated by the glory of God and by His Son will fill the holy city with light. But outside, we are told, outside the New Jerusalem will be a place of utter darkness where no light will shine, where the glory of God will not pierce and will not penetrate, and the radiance and the countenance of Christ will be shut out into this outer darkness. And in the outer darkness, there will be, as the Scriptures say, nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. You may not believe that. You may think that that's not true. You better hope that that's not true. But that message is on every page of sacred Scripture. That warning, that alert is there again and again and again. Do you want a future of utter, abysmal darkness? Beloved, you were made for fellowship and communion with God. You were created with a capacity to experience unspeakable joy in His presence. To be shut out of that presence to be in a place where there is no light and only darkness is the worst possible thing that could ever befall you. And so from the lips of Amos, we hear this dreadful announcement that the day of the Lord for some will be a day of darkness with no light in it. But again, remember that this message is not pronounced out in the streets to pagans. It is pronounced to people who are professing religion. And the very next phrase indicates it, where the prophecy goes on in the name of God saying, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. And though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments, but let justice or righteousness run down like water, like a mighty rolling 
stream. So he's talking to religious people. I despise your feasts. I hate your solemn assemblies. The sacrifices that you put on the altar have become a stench in my nostrils. Don't come into my presence with a show of religion while there's no righteousness in the land. You come with your sacrifices, I won't accept them. You say your prayers, I won't hear them. You sing your hymns, I won't listen to them. Because the sound of your music has become sour in my ears. This should make us tremble. Because again, this message is addressed to the religious community, to people who are actively engaged in the experience of worship, of singing, of praying, of celebrating feast days, sacraments, and the like. But God says, the church is like a wadi in Israel. And the wadi, W-A-D-I, are those huge, dry riverbeds. There are only two rainy seasons during the year. Most of the year, Israel is a desert. And those riverbeds are empty, not a drop of water to be found. But when the rains come, there is no place to contain the water. So all of the water runs off the desert floor into these wadis, these empty big ditches. And then it becomes a raging torrent through the desert. And he said, that's what I want to see happen in my church. I want to see righteousness come rushing through the church and through the people of God like the flowing rivers in the empty wadis. But at that moment, God had looked at his people and found nothing but empty cisterns and empty riverbeds. They were empty of righteousness. And for that reason... These people professed faith, had no fruit. And for people like that, the day of the Lord will be a day of darkness. No light in it. There is a blessing that God announces to those who genuinely love the Lord's appearing. And to be sure the promise of the future day of the Lord, for which we are still waiting, is a promise of blessedness. We call the coming of Christ the blessed hope of the church. And indeed it is the blessed hope of the church, and indeed it is your blessed hope, if indeed you belong to Christ. But I'm speaking now to people who are church members or churchgoers who participate in the singing and in the prayers and in the sacraments and all the accouterments of worship. Is it real? Is your faith sincere? Does it inform your life? Is the fruit of righteousness flowing out of you? If it is, then for you, the day of the Lord is a day of light with no darkness in it. For more information about Ligonier Ministries, call 1-800-435-4343 or contact us on the web at Ligonier.org. That's L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R dot O-R-G or write P.O. Box 54 7500, Orlando, Florida, 32854.